I'd like to take you back to the 1800s and talk to you about an individual who gives me great inspiration. Today, when we think about inspiration individuals, we think about those like Michael Jordan, who spent his life, for the most part, putting a little ball through a hoop. When we think about motivational individuals in our lives, we think about somebody like Dan Marino, who picked up a football and threw it across the field. We think about somebody like Dale Earnhardt, who got in a car and drove faster than all the others in the car on the racetrack. But my dear friends, none of these individuals inspire me more than the one I'm about to share with you today. In fact, this individual was living during a time period where, I say this truthfully, women were looked upon as their only role in society was the kitchen and having babies. And we know that women are far more valuable than just that. Not only was this individual a woman in the 1800s, but she had dark skin. And in this time period of our culture in the United States of America, that was looked down upon. But I share with you this lady by the name of Harriet Tubman was one of the most influential people of the 1800s and the early 1900s. She was born into slavery. And she was abused in ways that nobody here today has ever thought about being abused. She was mistreated, mishandled, and she had enough. And so she was a Christian, by the way, and she was inspired, I believe, by God to, to get up and travel across what's later known as the Underground Railroad. You know, what's interesting is you study Harriet Tubman's life. You know what people used to call her during her time period? They called her Moses. And you know what Moses did? Moses led the people of Israel out of a period of enslavement to the Egyptians and carried them to the Promised Land. And in Harriet's lifetime that she lived, she was taking her fellow black brothers and black sisters away from the bondage of slavery into a land of promise called freedom. Today I'm sure you're wondering why in the world am I talking about Harriet Tubman in an age where slavery has kind of not this culture, not this century anymore. Well, we are not enslaved in ways that we used to be, but I still believe slavery is still alive and well. But today as we come to our passage of Scripture, we find a verse that's been overlooked by scholars, a verse that has been just kind of mishandled by Christians and thought to be very unimportant. But today we find that a man by the name of Vanessimus, and by the way, I'm going to give you the title of my sermon at the end of the sermon. But if I could go back into the 1800s and share with Harriet Tubman, I wonder if, if she was inspired by this man in the Bible. Because just like Harriet Tubman, this man, Onesimus, was a slave. We find that in the book of Colossians, these Nine characters are mentioned towards the end, and most people in their Bible reading, they, they just overlook these. But I'm here to tell you something. For the true student of the Bible who's diligent in their study, they find these verses are full of rich biblical truths of the Word of God. And yes, I believe that slavery is wrong. And unfortunately, back in the 1800s and the early 1900s, there were Christians who would use the Bible to support their ideas of slavery. But let me share with you, in the book of Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy and, and Exodus, the Bible talks about slavery. And a lot of skeptics will come to the Bible and say, why would you believe a book that endorses slavery? Well, you have to understand in these cultures in the Old Testament and the New Testament time periods, slavery was a little bit different than the slavery that Harriet Tubman was involved with. They would kind of view slavery in a sense of like corporations. Masters had hired servants and they worked their job underneath that master. Today, most people are enslaved by their corporations they work for. But I want to share with you, uh, the Roman culture viewed slavery differently than the Jewish culture. The Roman culture mistreated slaves, kind of like, unfortunately, uh, the culture that we live in many years ago did. But the Jewish laws in the Old Testament said this, that concerning slaves, they were to be treated 
like a part of the household according to Leviticus chapter 25. And they became partakers of the covenant in Genesis chapter 17. They were freed during the sabbatical year of Exodus chapter 21. They, if, if a slave was harmed by their, quote, owner, they were given freedom according to Exodus chapter 21. And if somebody killed a slave, he would be severely punished according to Exodus chapter 21. And in Deuteronomy 23, the Bible talks about how if a slave escaped, they were to be neither hunted nor returned to their master. And it's very unfortunate that people would take the word of God and mishandle it to try to promote their cause. And by the way, I could teach you whatever I want to from the word of God. I could pull stuff out of context, not look at their entirety. But today as we look at this, we find that, that Onesimus was a slave, not to an unbeliever, but to a believer. Just food for thought, when you start reading the book of Colossians, we've studied how it deals with combating doctrinal heresy. But as you study the book of Colossians, when you get to chapter 4, the last several verses, you're going to come to the conclusion and understanding that when you are true to your study in the Bible, that this book, these last several verses, are very similar to another book in the Bible that is overlooked called Philemon. Philemon was a slave owner, and he owned this man by the name of Onesimus. And he served, Onesimus served Philemon. And so today I want to share with you three important Bible doctrines that I have gleaned from the life of Onesimus. And remember, I'm going to give you the title of my sermon at the end of the sermon. And so today I want you to keep your place here in the, in the Bible, but if we could just go to the epitaph and look at the cemetery and the grave spot of Onesimus, we find that these words are what the Holy Spirit penned through the mouth of the Apostle Paul in verse number 9 of Colossians 4. It says, with Onesimus, by the way, we looked at Tychicus last week, and they were the bearers of the letter of, of this book, Colossians, to the people of Colossae. And it says that with Onesimus concerning Tychicus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Paul was dealing with how Jesus is God, how there was doctrinal heresy creeping up in the church of Colossae, and how they needed to uh, work on these things and, and keep Christ focused. And by the way, uh, earlier in chapter 4, verse number 1, and then in chapter 3, we talked about the servant and master's roles within society. And we're not going to dive back into that, but we find that here, perhaps Paul, when he's writing about the servants and he's writing about the masters, it is very likely that when he's writing about it, he has Onesimus and Philemon on his mind. You say, well, what is the connection with Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul and the Colossians. Well, I'm glad you asked, because Philemon was a resident of Colossae. We find that Onesimus and Philemon lived in the area that this letter was written to. And that's why the Bible says in verse number nine, who is one of you? If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn over to the book of Philemon. Uh, if you've never read it, I want to encourage you to read it. Just go to the right in, in the Bible, and it's right after the book of Titus, right before uh, Hebrews. But just kind of hold your spot there in Colossians as well, as we'll come back to that towards the end. But I want to share with you, as we're writing, as we're reading this book and studying Colossians, that in order to properly understand Colossians and this character of the Bible, we need to incorporate a study in Philemon. We find that Paul is writing to Philemon a one chapter, 25 verses, a very short letter. And this is one of the letters that the Apostle Paul actually penned himself. A lot of times he would speak about what he wanted to write about and he would have others pen the words for him. But not the case in this letter. He was personally writing to Philemon with his own hand and with his own pen and with his own paper. And I want to draw your attention uh, to, to verses 8 through uh, 22. And I want to share with you from this section of Scripture, in correlation to the book of Colossians, three important Bible doctrines that we glean from the life of Onesimus. Look at verses uh, uh, 8 and 9 real fast. It says, Wherefore, although I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient. Yet for love's sake, 
I rather beseech thee. So the word beseech means to beg, earnestly beg. Being such and one as Paul the age. So Paul is no longer young. He is now probably around 60-ish years old, give or take, writing this letter. He is in bonds in Rome, we believe, and he's writing back, and he's uh, wise in his understanding of the Scriptures. He's lived longer than a lot of people that lived in his time, and he's gained great wisdom of God. And he says uh, in verse number 9, uh, the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at verses 10. As I read verses 10 through 14, I wrote down this. Here's the first doctrine I've gleaned from the life of Onesimus, the doctrine of salvation. And I wrote down these three words. Salvation brings freedom. Salvation brings freedom. Look at verse 10. It says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sinned again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. As I read these four verses, I read this. The doctrine of salvation. And then I wrote down this. Salvation brings freedom. Just as Harriet Tubman was fed up with being mistreated as a slave, she departed and she became a revolutionary and a visionary and an inspiration to her fellow brothers and sisters in the 1800s. She was fed up with being treated as a slave, and so was Onesimus for some reason. And Onesimus left, and he was a runaway slave. And it's interesting. You see the sovereignty of God at work in the life of Onesimus. He was a slave serving underneath Philemon. And for some reason or another, he left. And as he was running away from his earthly master, he was introduced to his heavenly master. And at some point, the Apostle Paul, we probably believe it was on his third missionary journey. So Paul had three missionary journeys. And on his third missionary journey, we, we believe that is the time frame of when Paul met Onesimus. And Paul began to share the great story of salvation with him. And he said, hey, I just want to let you know, I, I remember writing to the book of, uh, of Galatians how, how, you know, when you're in Christ, there's neither rich nor poor. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither Jew nor Gentile for those who are in Christ. He says, I know that you've been entangled in bonds and you've been a slave and a servant, but in Jesus Christ, he looks at all of us to say, it doesn't matter if you're rich or wealthy and you live in a $30 million household or you live on the side of the street corner. It doesn't matter because God sees you for what you are, and that is made in his image. Salvation brings freedom. And so as Philemon uh, was uh, wrestling in his mind about what he was going to do with Onesimus, Onesimus finds Paul, and Paul shares the greatest news ever. And that is how Jesus died for your sins. And he paid your penalty of sin on Calvary's cross. And how he rose again victoriously and offers life. And at some point, Onesimus bowed his knee and confessed with his mouth that Jesus Christ was Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Listen, I know there's a lot of people today who say all sorts of stuff about salvation. But salvation is by grace through faith. It cannot be earned by our own merit. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. You know, I was out so winning at the University of Tennessee when I was in Bible college. And when I would use that term wages, I would always ask, have you ever had a job? And I kid you not, the majority of the students at the University of Tennessee that I dealt with never had a job. Isn't that interesting? How some folks, some young people, they get out of college to, to be hired for their very first job. I just thought it was astounding. I thought it was very interesting. But, but the Bible says, for the wages of sin, because of what you and I earn, our paycheck, the Bible says, is death. And that word death, yes, it means physically dying, but in the context of the passage, it means eternal torments in a horrible place the Bible describes as hell. And so it says, for the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift, you understand that? A gift is not something that you can pay for, not something you can earn, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that was the message that Paul shared with Onesimus, and it's the message that we are called to share with the world today. So if some crazy quack knocks on your door and tells you otherwise, just point to them the Word of God. I mean, I can share with you just in the Gospel of John how the salvation is by grace through faith. I mean, the Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, to as many that believe in his name. Listen, John 3, 16 and 17, you know those verses, but 17 says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans chapter 10 talks about how if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. It says, For whosoever... That means anybody. You know what that means? That means whether you're rich or poor. That means whether you're male or female. That means whether you're Jew or Gentile. That means whether you're bond or free. You can call upon the name of Jesus. And that message hit home with our dear brother, Onesimus, about 2,000 years ago. Salvation brings freedom. So he was introduced to the greatest thing. I know we live in America, and we enjoy great liberties that a lot of other countries do not enjoy. But the greatest freedom you'll ever experience is freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom in Jesus Christ is the greatest freedom that you will ever experience in this life and in the life to come. In fact, if you do not receive salvation, you may have freedom on this earth, but you will not have freedom in the afterlife. If you reject Jesus Christ as Savior, you will not have the privilege of spending eternity with Christ in heaven. As I have been meditating here in the life of Onesimus and studying Philemon and the Apostle Paul, not only did I write down the doctrine of salvation and how salvation brings freedom, but I wrote down, second, secondly, the doctrine of restoration. As I read verses 15 through 17. Now, before I share this with you, uh, I want you to know that Paul sent Tychicus and Onesimus with the letter of Colossians to the church at Colossae. Now, Philemon had a church in his home, so most likely there were multiple churches in this city. And so they were sent to deliver a special message to the entire body of believers in Colossae. But Paul sent, guess who, to send his letter to Philemon. He sent his runaway slave, Onesimus. And in verses 15, 16, and 17, we find the doctrine of restoration. And I wrote down this, restore broken relationships. Restore broken relationships. Look at verse 15, it says, Perhaps, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. So check it out now. He said, hey, Onesimus left underneath your authority as a runaway slave. He was lost and unsaved, but during his time running away, he was introduced to Jesus Christ, and now you can receive him for all eternity. And verse 16 goes on to say, Not now as a servant, but a brother servant. A brother beloved. By the way, whether you're a CEO or just the guy or the gal scrubbing the toilets, you are important in the eyes of Almighty God. doesn't matter if you or a politician, or the President of the United States, or the hillbilly from the back hills of West Virginia. You are important in the eyes of Almighty God. It says, not now as a servant, but as a, but a brother servant. A, be, a brother beloved. In Colossians it says, a beloved brother. And it says, specially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now count me therefore a partner. Receive him as myself. Most likely Philemon treated Onesimus very respectively according to the principles in the Old Testament book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. But we'll find in this passage that, in this chapter, that when Onesimus ran away, he ran away with some items in his pockets. So he stole something from Philemon. 
And he's running away. And so as Philemon uh, comes and sees the knock, and hears the knock at the door, and walks to the door, and sees that there's a guy holding a letter, and perhaps he had a, a hat on or something covering up his face, and when he pulls it off his face, you know what he sees? He sees his runaway slave stole stuff from him. What do you think is going through his eyes, his mind? Well, probably the same thing that's going through yours right now. But Paul says, restore the broken relationship. So we see in the midst of this scene, in the midst of the book of Colossians being written in the book of Philemon, we see that God is not only emphasizing salvation, but he's emphasizing restoration. And before we can ever be reconciled with, with God in a sense, we have to also be reconciled with our common fellow men and women. If we can't get our relationship here on earth settled, how do you think we can get our relationship with Almighty God settled? And by the way, it's nothing we can do to do it. It's God's grace and mercy who intervenes and helps us. And so today, maybe you're here and your relationship with God is just shattered. And it's like a big old glass vase and it's broken into 5,000 pieces. And the only way for it to get put back together is through the mighty mercy and grace of God. If you have been restored in your relationship with Christ and you have broken relationships in your family or your friends, or co-workers, or whoever. It's time that we restore those. Philemon was a master or a boss to his servant Onesimus. And according to this passage, we have every reason to believe that they restored their situations. They looked past because of their great God, Jesus Christ. I like what somebody said. We're going to spend all eternity together, so we better start getting along here on this earth. <laughs> May God help us do that. The doctrine of salvation. Salvation brings freedom. The doctrine of restoration. Restore broken relationships. But now I want to share with you from verses 18 through 22. This is something that we don't talk a lot about, but it's called the doctrine of imputation. The doctrine of imputation. Here's all what that means. All my sin was placed on Christ's account. I'll say that again. All my sin was placed on Christ's account. Look at Paul's words in verse 18. It says, if he hath wronged thee, or owed thee yacht, check it out now, this is the exact meaning of the word imputation. The theological term imputation. It says, put that on my account. He says, hey, uh, uh, Philemon, my brother, if, if, if this guy in Esmus has stolen something from you, if he owes you money, if he owes you time, if he owes you talents, if he owes you treasures, he said, just put all that on my account. You know what Jesus did 2,000 years ago? He said, as he's our, our inner assessor between man and God the Father, he says, um, I'm just going to take all of your nasty, filthy, dirty, rotten, wicked sin, and I'm going to put it on my account. And so when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, every lie you've ever told, every inappropriate thought you've ever thought about, everything you've ever said that was hurtful or wrong, everything you've ever done that was sin against God, it was placed upon Jesus. And he has taken his righteousness and he's imputed his righteousness to you and to me. So now when he sees us, when he sees me, he doesn't see a black-hearted, sinful Brian. He sees a pure, chaste child of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. The great reformer, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, as he was studying Philemon and Onesimus and the life of Paul, you know what he said about Onesimus? I thought it was true. He said, we are all the Lord's Onesimus. There was a day where we were all like sheep who have gone astray. We were running so fast and so far from God that we couldn't hear the sound of the still small voice called the Holy Spirit. But there was a day where he reached out and he saved your soul and saved my soul. And now all the things we've ever done or ever will do is placed on Jesus' account. Look at verse 19. It says, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. <laughs> wow. We see a great picture of Jesus Christ in these verses. How he has paid our penalty.
Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Now, check it out now. It's interesting how these words in this letter, we find that not only did Paul lead Onesimus to the Lord, but as you study these passages of Scripture, you find out Paul led Philemon to the Lord as well. And in verse 20, it says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Today we are looking at the life of Onesimus. We are emphasizing the doctrine of imputation, how Jesus took our sins and he applied them to his account. Now, let me just illustrate it this way. Let's say I decided I was feeling extra generous and I took all of you out to lunch. <laughs> and I asked the waitress or the waiter for the bill and I put it all in my account, you know, my card. I paid for it all. That would be very generous, right? Well, all imputation is, is, <laughs> yeah, you'd be smiling and saying, well, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You see, I, I find it interesting that, that whenever somebody buys something for somebody else, if it, they were buying it, they would, they would get the cheapest thing in the menu. But when somebody else buys it for them, they get the most expensive thing in the menu. So I know it's going through your minds right now that if I take you out to eat, you'd be saying, I'm going to get the most expensive thing on that menu and drain your account. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter if you would get the cheapest thing from the menu or the most expensive thing from the menu. It doesn't matter if, you're, if your meal was a dollar or a thousand dollars. It doesn't matter if you've only sinned a little bit in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter if you've sinned greatly in the eyes of God. All of that is on Jesus' account. Today, as we look at Onesimus' life, I want to close with my sermon title. As I look at the epitaph of Onesimus, I wrote it like this. Onesimus. Once a slave to sin, but now a servant of God. I once was a slave to sin, but now I am a servant of God. I hope you can say the same. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you that it has power.